joining us. Uh, we'll need to take a verbal roll call here before we get started. Commissioner Hemmer, are you here? Present. Commissioner Bergeron, are you here? Present. Commissioner Weiner, are you here? Present. Great. Awesome. Um, in just a moment, we'll be taking public comment. Um, it's going to be coming up shortly, and we're going to be taking all the calls for all agenda items at the same time. So members of the public wishing to speak on matters posted for public comment time may call the following number, 629-255-1939. Again, that number is 629-255-1939. And we will circle back in just a moment to see if we have anyone on the line. Before we get started, we need to address that this is a virtual meeting. So I move that the proposed agenda constitutes essential business and meeting electronically as necessary to protect the health, safety, and well-being of Tennesseans in light of the COVID-19 outbreak. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a verbal roll call vote. Commissioner Hemmer? Aye. Commissioner Bergeron? Aye. Commissioner Weiner. Aye. And I, Commissioner McNally, am also aye. With that vote, we can officially uh, call the meeting to order. So officially, welcome to the February 2021 Fair Board meeting. Before moving on, we will read the legal notice. As information for our audience, if you're not satisfied with the decision made by the Metropolitan Board of Fair Commissioners today, you may appeal the decision by petitioning for a writ of cert with the Davidson County Chancery or Circuit Court. Your appeal must be filed within 60 days of the date of the entry of the board's decision. To ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner and that all procedural requirements have been met, please be advised that you should contact your own independent legal counsel. All right. Now we have next on the agenda approval of the last month's board minutes, which have been circulated to everyone. I'll give everyone a chance to look these over and let me know if there's a motion. Commissioner Hammer, I have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? This is Commissioner Weiner, second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, roll call vote. Commissioner Hammer? Aye. Commissioner Bergeron? Aye. Commissioner Weiner? Aye. Excellent, and I am um, also an I. All right, now it's time for public comment. Um, for members of the public wishing to call in, I'm gonna read that number again in case anyone missed it at the top of the meeting. So if you'd like to make a comment, please call us at 629-255-1939. But before we get started with calls, I do I wanna take a moment to say that we've received a, a great number of, an extraordinary number of emails over the last 24 hours. And so before we start taking the calls, I would like to, um, open the floor to Councilman Sledge, if he would like to, um, to say anything. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you, members, um, for the continued work that you do. Um, I think a lot of the, the folks who may be calling in are in part based on a conversation we had yesterday um, regarding two items that, that this board, that affect this board. Um, one of which is the uh, funding for Fair Park. I think everyone on the board is aware that the mayor's capital spending plan does not include um, the final funding needed um, to complete the park. Um, I don't even tell anybody on this board how critical that funding is to uh, completing the Greenway, connecting to the new bus stops on Nolansville, um, mitigating the continued um, you know, mitigating Browns Creek and actually continuing to improve um, the flooding situation there. Um, I have filed a budget substitute that would add in that seven million to our capital spending plan that's around 470 million. So I'm awaiting to hear from the finance director um, as to whether we can spare another one and a half percent on capital spending plan. Um, so I wanted to make sure that you, that the board was aware that I'm making those efforts, and I think you probably heard from several people over the last 24 hours at their support as well. Um, the second issue is regarding the makeup of the board itself. Um, 
as you're probably aware, uh, you have had an open seat next to you for a while, um, virtually, um, and that appointment has passed to the vice mayor because of the time that is taken. Um, I and several other members over the, the past year basically have tried to um, appeal to the mayor and his office when they had the when they had the appointment to appoint somebody of color and specifically um, somebody of Latino descent who lives along the Knowlesville Pike corridor um, because of the impact this uh, property has on that community and because um, that community is underrepresented um, in our boards and commissions and this is a particularly important one. Um, since then, there obviously is another seat that is coming up for expiration. Uh, I had asked the office to consider appointing a person of color in that regard. Um, and I think that's what you'll hear from statements today. I think it's incredibly important that we are diversifying all our boards and commissions, but this one in particular, um, I think suffers from that lack of diversity and just to give a couple of quick examples to the board. So some of you were here when I stood before you about six years ago and showed photos of images of the Confederate flag being promoted with the, uh, with the property and where it was on the property. Um, these were issues that the board wasn't even aware of um, and there wasn't a discussion being had at the time. Since then, I'm glad to say that the board's had several discussions about what imagery means on our properties and specifically on the fairgrounds, I feel like our, our like discussions like that could be enhanced, improved, and better reflective of our community if the board is better reflective of our community. Um, so I appreciate the board. I, I always appreciate the work that you do. Um, I appreciate the board listening to participants and constituents today on these issues. Um, and I thank you, as always, for your service. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Sledge. Um, I'm, I'm going to say something personal here. This is not on behalf of the board. Um, I want to give board members an, uh, a chance to say their thoughts as well. But um, I agree on both fronts. Um, and I want to say, you know, procedurally for folks that might not understand because it is um, sort of a nerdy part of the way that the city functions, um, some of the emails that we received made it um, sound like we were appointing the, the the board members. I just want to make sure procedurally people understand that it does typically run through the mayor's office for those appointments, um, and that we 100% agree with with this, um, or I 100% agree with this. And we've attempted for quite some time to let the administration know that um, that we think it's paramount not only to the success of our board to have diverse representation, but to the city of Nashville as well. This this property is an incredibly diverse neighborhood and the city um, is diverse as well. And we've been working really hard as a board over the past few years to assure that this property is inclusive and welcoming to all the city's citizens. Um, so I, I, I just wanna share in, in your um, your wishes there. Um, I also do, we, we have Mr. Bill Phillips here from the mayor's office and we're gonna hear from him in just one second, but I do wanna open it up just in case any other board members have anything to add here. And no pressure, you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> just Commissioner Hammer, I just wanted to tell uh, C Councilman Sledge, thank you for, for uh, your comments and leadership on this issue. I think we uh, uh, really appreciate that, uh, bring, bringing uh, the community and your, your districts, uh, uh, as well as the council perspective to this, and, and also that we're, we're open ears and, and really uh, agree with, with a lot of things you said. Thank you for, for bringing it to our attention. Anyone else? Okay, great. Um, Mr. Phillips, you're with us, I believe. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. Um, I can't argue with the councilman. Um, I think that it's important, and uh, the mayor certainly thinks it's important that our boards and commissions be diverse and represent the entire county. Um, I understand the concern the councilman has about his immediate district, but uh, the mayor represents the whole county, so we have to look at it that way. In uh, regards to minority appointments, uh, in the mid 40% of appointments he has made in the little over a year he's been here, they have been minority and women. Um, we continue to go through appointments as they come up. The fairground appointment, unfortunately, has gotten entangled in procedure and deadline. 
we had an appointment um, that we sent to the council. The nominee then decided to withdraw. Um, we sent a second appointment up, but unfortunately it was past the deadline. Uh, this is an African-American appointment, uh, lives in, works in the area of the fairgrounds as a business person. Uh, and the vice uh, mayor is looking at that along with one or two other possible appoint, appointees. And I'm told he'll be making a decision on that soon. Uh, the second appointment that is coming up, we have uh, sent up a renomination, uh, reappointment. Uh, of a fine um, member of your commission, your board. And uh, we feel very good about that individual and they bring in a perspective um, that other board members um, will, uh, will be complimented, their, their abilities will be complimented by this individual. And that's been proven time and again uh, since uh, she first started. So, Makeup of boards and commissions in Metro is extremely important. It's a high priority. We take each appointment very seriously. Um, in the case of this one appointment to the fair board, unfortunately, it got bogged down uh, through the process because of um, an individual not being able to serve after they had agreed to be appointed. So they withdrew and that threw us behind. Um, I am confident the vice mayor is going to make a solid, reasonable decision on that particular appointment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Phillips. Now we're going to open the floor for public comment. I'll read that phone number one more time. It's 629-255-1939. And as a reminder, each caller has two minutes to speak um, and we'll, we cap the public comment time at 15 minutes total. So that being said, if there, um, there's anyone that we don't get to today, um, please feel free to email us or call us board members. We really appreciate hearing from you. Um, and I believe the emails that we've received to this point are in the board packet, so they should be available to WebEx participants, but we'll also um, forward any of those that didn't make it to the administration on. Ms. Yes. Hey, uh, this is Commissioner Bergeron. Um, I, I believe Ms. Kelly is on the WebEx and, and, and would like to speak during public comment time. Um, and I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was phone only or not, but I, I just want to throw it out there. I see her on the attendee list. Okay, great. Yeah, Ms. Kelly, if you want to kick it off, that'd be great. Oh. This might be a question for IT. Can she... Yes, we're, we're working on getting her through. Just one second. And we've got perfect. two callers in the queue after that, okay? Okay, perfect. Hello. Can you guys Hi. Hi, good morning. Um, uh, Odessa Kelly, I live at uh, 1127 Cahal Avenue. Um, thank you for having me this morning. I am the executive director of Stand Up Nashville. Uh, we represent a little over 60,000 voting members of this city. And I too, like Councilman Sledge, and I'm pretty sure you as well, have received a ton of phone calls and even house visits about the makeup of the board and also to the, um, the standing of the CBA and where we are in the development on the uh, property as well. Uh, I too just wanted to double down on what Kobe said. I under fully understand that you guys do not uh, appoint people to this board, but we are very concerned about the makeup of this board. Um, essentially, there are two seats open. And yes, as we do know, the mayor does have the right to appoint people. The There were individuals who were brought up, um, Sandra Sepulveda, a councilwoman San uh, Sepulveda, um, she nominated a person, and I'm pretty sure people don't know the process she went through. Um, she went through asking community uh, members and stakeholders who was someone that they trusted and thought would be a fair voice to uh, sit on this board because he would represent the Nolasville corridor and a lot of the needs that are needed there. I don't know why this person wasn't considered, but I have, have overwhelming calls 
again um, for the past two or three days about getting that individual on the fair board. So I'm hoping um, that people will really take a strong look. He is a, a, a person of color who um, is overqualified to sit on this board. And for the other seat, we know two or three African-American females um, who are overqualified as well to sit on this board and could be really impactful on giving a perspective that is needed um, in how the development is happening. Um, you know, some decisions that are being made and making sure that all the marginalized groups in this city, as Mr. Phillips spoke to, are represented fully. So I just wanted to make sure that that point was said. And also, uh, I see that the uh, community benefits agreement is coming up later on the agenda. Um, I would love to have an opportunity to chime in on that as well, given that we were the group that crafted it, and we're the ones that are overseeing um, and making sure that it's working well for the people um, who are supposed to benefit. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Christy. And Allison, do we have anyone on the line? Yes, Chairman McAnally, your first caller is on the line. Okay, great. Thanks so much for calling in. If you could please identify yourself and state your address in two minutes. Caller, you can go ahead. Uh, is it my turn? Yes. Yes, it's very hard to hear, so I'm going to speak. My name is Daniel Barron. I am um, um, resp responding to a request by Colby Sledge that members of the public um, speak about a uh, fair board appointee. Uh, I'd like to point out that the fair board is a countywide board. Uh, it's not resident-led, as, as he has suggested, as if that uh, suggests it's community-based. Um, appointees have historically had uh, experience that um, helps support the board to put on an annual divisional fair. Uh, the, the current board has not accomplished a divisional fair in nearly a decade. Um, Colby has also requested that um, this uh, future appointment um, be based on, on the, the, the the pretense of, of diversity and inclusion. Um, and I just would like to point out that um, I don't think this, this he stands for such. Uh, he's standing on it for his own self-aggrandizement. If he stood for that, he would not have ignored the residents and community of Vine Hill to the west of Fairgrounds property uh, in the years since all of the, the buildup and, and hoopla to, to get to the property redeveloped as, a, as an MLS property. Um, you know, going forward, this board needs to have appointees who, who can accomplish a divisional fair, regardless of skin pigment. Um, and thanks for your time. Bye-bye. Okay, moving along. Uh, Christy, do we have any other callers? Yes, we're getting them queued up. Just one second. Perfect. Chairman McAnally, your call is all, callers on the line. Great, thank you so much for calling in. Could you please identify yourself and state your address and you have two minutes. Yes, this is Nicola Stanley at 813 Warner Avenue in Nashville, 37204. So I'm in the Melrose area, close to the fairground. Um, I'm calling um, to, to ask that Two Nashvilleans of color um, be considered and placed on the open fairgrounds and rich seats. Um, ideally, I think it, somebody from the Latinx population in the neighborhood that's near the fairgrounds, and also some of our black uh, neighbors that are also in the area. Um, and the other. The other request is to fund the final phase of the fair park. I was driving by yesterday and it was so good to see people out walking and um, the dogs out in the park. And I was here during the 2010 floods and Browns Creek sure was a mess. It, it became Browns Lake over there. So I think anything we can do to look 
you know, be forward thinking with the uh, green space and the management of Browns Creek in that area would be fantastic. You've done such a fantastic job with that fair, the fair park. It's wonderful to see everybody out and neighborhood neighbors mingling and happy dogs. And we need things like that that uplift their spirits during this time. Thank you so very much for all the work you do. And I hope you'll consider to give, you know, I, th I hope you'll, you'll appoint good people on, on the board that can represent the diversity of Nashville. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Th that would be it. Thank you. Great, thanks. Christy? Chairman McNally, we, we don't have any more callers, but uh, we need to wait about 30 seconds. There's a little bit of a delay just to make sure no one else has, has tried to call in. Okay, great. We'll commence some awkward silence then. Chairman McNally, we have no more calls. Okay, great. Um, so if that's everybody, we're gonna close the floor for public comment. But as I mentioned, please reach out to us, email us or call us board members um, with your thoughts. So moving on in the agenda, we have first up financial report from Satrice. Satrice, you can take it away. Good morning, everyone. The information presented today is preliminary and all of the revenue and expenses for January 2021 may not have been recorded to the ledgers as of February 5th, 2021 when this report was created. The preliminary actuals through January 2021 are as follows. Revenues through January are $333,576 Expenditures are around $1,178,279, resulting in a net loss of approximately $844,700. Depreciation expense is $832,896, so the total net loss is roughly $1,677,600. Below you will find an itemized list of our expenditures. Our top three expenses are payroll, utilities, and insurance slash low cap. Payroll expense is approximately six, 608858 dollars, which represents fifty-two percent of our total expenses. Utility expense is $213,377, which is 18%. Insurance permits and low cap expense is $227,619, which is 19% of our total expenses. Supplies has a credit of $700, roughly $700 due to reimbursement of damaged golf carts, which we plan to replace. I am happy to report that we have been approved to receive a community development block grant from HUD, the Department of Housing and Urban Development of roughly $350,000 for allowable costs related to the emergency shelter held at the fairgrounds. We are also currently examining the SBOG which stands for the Shuttered Venue Operator Grant to see if we meet the criteria and eligibility to apply. 
The SBOG is emergency assistance for eligible venues affected by the COVID pandemic. I would like to mention that budget season is underway and we will be preparing to submit our FY22 budget information to the Department of Finance by next week. This concludes the financial report. Are there any questions? Yes, Satrice, this is uh, Commissioner Amber. Can you repeat them out for the CDBG grant, please? Uh, roughly 350000 Thank you. Any other questions from the board? Okay, thank you so much, Satrice. We'll move on now to the Executive Director's Report. Laura? Hey, good morning, everyone. Laura Womack. Um, I, I want to piggyback on uh, Citrice's financial update because um, one, you know, we've we've all learned a lot about what eligible funding um, is available to us for um, in response to the pandemic and our role in hosting Metro Shelter. Um, so I do want to give a, a lot of. Um, uh, credit to Citrice for working through that, as well as um, Miss Mary Jo Wiggins from uh, Metro Finance. They, you know, they've got um, a big job to to keep track of all of those uh, potential funding sources and making sure that you know eligible expenses are um, do qualify. So I, I do want to thank um, Miss Wiggins for all of her guidance as we work through some of those new programs that have come online. Um, Satrice mentioned that we were working on our FY22 budget, and I just wanted to go over briefly some of the steps that we're taking. Um, first of all, we're gonna be revising our revenue estimates. I think it's safe to say that we are still going to be impacted by the pandemic once our new fiscal year hits on July 1st of 2021. Um, as a result, we're looking very thoughtfully at our revenue, assuming that at a minimum, there's probably going to be some attendance caps and capacity caps inside the buildings and probably outside at that time. Um, so I think it's gonna be smart to be a little bit more conservative with revenue. So we're gonna be looking at um, revising some of those revenue numbers from this year to next year's fiscal year. We're also gonna be revising our expenditures. Uh, I think that we'll see a reduction in our expenses because again, as we're not possibly going to be hosting as many people as we're used to, and because some of our businesses that we traditionally have contracted with, with events, unfortunately have not survived the pandemic. Um, we also anticipate that uh, the flea market may see an impact from individuals who um, are no longer in business. So we, we may see decreases there again with the attendance capacities that could also impact revenue um, and then also have a um, corresponding reduction in expenses as far as maybe security and or temporary staff that needs to assist us in putting on those events. The other thing that we will be working on is a 2% reduction. So all departments within Metro have been asked to look at expenses and do a 2% reduction. Um, I do think that we'll be able to, to absorb this if it is makes it through the budget cycle, um, again, because of an expense reduction that we anticipate going into the fiscal year related to the pandemic. There is also a 4% list, so this is ca cash capital, um, things like equipment and um, things that don't normally fall into a capital project per se. Um, what we have traditionally had on our list are um, big pieces of equipment to help us do what we do with events, and that is things like forklift, a garbage truck, 
Um, and this year we do need a, a new lift for the expos. Our ceilings are um, much taller in the new buildings than our old buildings. And so we do not currently own a lift that is tall enough, one, to work on lights, and two, if we did anything special with signage or such. So we are looking to have a new lift funded uh, so that we can uh, properly you know, run and maintain our expo buildings. Couple ads that we are looking at are converting our reservation system to a new software system. One that will give us the ability to do online payments, which certainly has become the norm um, over the years. And especially during the pandemic, uh, there, there's a lot less cash handling these days. And it, now's the time for us to look at updating our 35 year old uh, reservation system and looking at a cloud-based subscription-based service um, so we'll be looking at that. There is a cost associated with that. So we're also um, analyzing ways in which we can offset that expense. And then fair funding. Um, as you know, we're, we're progressing with plans to uh, how we can go about doing a divisional fair. Um, with that comes some comes with some upfront costs, and one of those that we were looking at is adding a staff person to assist with um, that divisional fare. Um, that certainly probably is not the only expense that would need to be added, but we are evaluating um, what that could be, what that position could look like, and how that position could also assist in other areas of the work that we do. So with that, I just wanted to give you an update on that. It, we're going to be um, submitting at least a, an initial um, run at our FY22 budget next week. And so staff is busy uh, doing all their calculations. So we will be sending that out to you for your information uh, as soon as it's complete. Thank you, Laura. Do we have any questions from the board? All right, if no questions, we'll move on to old business, starting with fairgrounds improvement updates. Mr. Henley, are you with us? I am, and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, awesome. Well, well good morning, um, board, staff, uh, council, and other officials and representatives present this morning. Um, I'll be reviewing the, the fairgrounds improvement uh, project budgets. I uh, want to highlight a few updates since our last board meeting. Um, each of the board members should have access to the budget dashboard uh, for reference. I'll be addressing some items of note and, and working my way through that dashboard. Um, I haven't said this, I don't believe, in the, in the past few meetings, but I, but I do also want to highlight that um, information, while, while dated and presented today, is approximately you know as many as 45 to 60 days um, in the rears as we are reflecting um, invoices that have been reviewed, um, submitted for payment, and then actually processed. So there is some time delay from um, what may be current um, and actual versus what's being presented today. So I just wanted to state that. Um, but I will start um, very high level um, in terms of all allocation of funds for fairgrounds improvements, uh, we're about 94% uh, expended uh, as of February the 9th. Uh, we have, of course, um, as it relates to the Exposition Center, um, zeroed or 100% complete um, on the line item for construction. Uh, we do still have a few um, line items that are active. Um, the one with the most activity that you will likely see and what I want to address uh, this morning is the ff &E line item. Um, it was the line item that was reduced quite significantly during construction to ensure that we had uh, the funds needed for, for completing the project. But as I mentioned in our last meeting, um, there would be an adjustment to the ff &E line item to cover some upcoming expenditures um, that were deferred during that time period. So reflected um, this morning on the budget, you will see um, increase from that line item that was $500,000 to $600,000. Um, and the, the location where those funds are offset was the project contingency that was just shy of $200,000 uh, the last time we presented. 
And so uh, we've already started to see and, and work with um, staff over at the fairgrounds to uh, populate uh, an ad the additional budget in terms of items that will be spent there. But I did want to highlight that as it is a it is a true change from from last month. The area where, um, again, the most activity will occur in the coming months, uh, but not yet present on the on the budget, uh, is the multi-purpose building. And so that is the area where the majority of remaining funds are allocated. Uh, we have started construction meetings. Uh, KJ Associates, who is our, our construction manager and general contractor for the project, uh, we do have their first invoice under review, and that will be submitted shortly. Uh, but we are awaiting uh, final approval of permitting prior to beginning the site work in that area. We do have um, funds allocated for design project management, as well as a, a small contingency um, for that work also still present. So none of those line items have changed. Just wanted to inform the board um, that there is progress happening, even though it may not be reflected in that area. Um, demolition of the existing structures. Uh, again, that work has been completed and the contract has been closed out. Uh, but I did want to um, highlight that uh, one of the costs uh, or line items in that in that area is related to the storage of materials and items that belong to the fairgrounds while we construct the multi-purpose building. And so um, there have been uh, some invoices received related to that storage in that area. So that that has moved the dial a small bit there. Um, and so if you're looking at the dashboard, you will see that area expanded again so you can um, look at the line items. Um, but also you will see a significant contingency that's there. Uh, as I reported last time, um, the anticipation for that is to, excuse the background noise, Ambulance go by, apologies. Um, but the purpose for for um, that project contingency is to be distributed across the most appropriate uses. Um, very, very um, relevant example was what I just presented regarding the FF and E uses. At this time, um, I've mentioned that the grandstands do have a few items outstanding, primarily regarding uh, work with HVAC units um, on top of the grandstand structure. Uh, we did receive um, our first two invoices, I believe two invoices related um, to the work that Lee Company is performing there. So while that uh, amount outstanding um, at our at the last board meeting was right around sixty thousand dollars, you'll see that that outstanding amount is now around forty thousand dollars. So about twenty thousand dollars of expenditures related to that work has occurred. Um, or I should say has been invoiced and approved in the last in the last month. That brings the total of outstanding funds um, as a cost to complete for the projected projects of uh, $2.5 million, um, $68,385. That's, again, a, a leveling of the 94% um, complete and the 6% that's outstanding. If there are no questions on those items. I'll move to the Fair Park budget. Hearing none, um, again, I would, I would, well, I think I, I should, <laughs> I should communicate that while there's no movement since um, our last month, um, no movement to report on this budget, uh, for clarification, uh, some of the comments that were made earlier regarding the capital spending plan, um, the budget that's presented and has been discussed with this board over the past few months is composed of previous allocations. Um, and those provided the funding for the phases of the fair park that have been designed and construction has been completed. Uh, I did just want to take time to highlight that. If there are no questions for me, um, I will pass the mic to uh, Ron, who may want to give an update uh, related to infrastructure. Uh, thanks, Ed. Uh, yeah, I think that the infrastructure and the multipurpose building that we Ed just mentioned is is coordinating uh you're going to see construction activity on starting on both within the next month um it's obviously complicated by having wedge, the extension of wedgewood and primarily benton going between a variety of projects um, so we're coordinating those working with the fairgrounds on their schedule and uh preparing to start construction and get 
going in the next and within the next month or so uh, again depending permitting and and coordination uh, that's about all I have on the uh, infrastructure unless there's some questions are there any questions thank you madam chair thank you mr. gobble thank you mr. Henley Chair McAnally? Yes, go ahead. Uh, this is Commissioner Bergeron. It, it, it now seems like just a good time. I, since Fair Park has come up, I, I did want it. I think it's important um, to to address what's going on with Fair Park a little bit. And, and um, I know we have some, some folks from the mayor's office on it. And, and I just want to encourage the mayor's office to complete the funding for Fair Park Phase 2, which uh, is time sensitive due to the stormwater variance, my understanding is, but also it's just essential to completing that project. Um, uh, and I have to, I have to sort of connect up to something we're going to be talking a little later. You know, I, the latest sort of rendering of a site plan I've seen of, of the new Speedway facility proposal um, impedes quite a bit on the existing Fair Park, and, and that's a change from um, um, two previous versions I've seen last year. And, and, and in discussions, initial discussions with SMI, they indicated to me that that, that was the mayor's office's design. And so uh, I mentioned that just because it kind of does feel like a little bit of a, a one-two punch here. I haven't had a chance to speak to anybody in the mayor's office yet about this. I'm still waiting to hear back about that design, but it seems like a bit of a one-two punch to be impeding upon phase one of Fair Park and then not funding phase two, um, especially where it, timing is critical. So um, I, I just really have to express some, some disappointment in those two pieces together. And, and I, I, I strongly hope that Fair Park Phase Two um, gets funded in this capital spending plan, um, and that long-standing plan is completed uh, due to all the considerations and connectivity to the site and out off the site, as Councilman Sledge mentioned. Um, I, I just hope that the that the finance director and the mayor's office put that funding into this capital spending plan. I think it's it's essential and. Uh, certainly under the circumstances of perhaps cutting fair park cutting into fair park uh, existing footprint on other parts um certainly phase two should get funded thank you commissioner bergeron and um i agree with you i also think it's important that we have this as an agenda item on the next meeting for sure um any oh go ahead yeah, Chairman McNally, this is Commissioner Hamrad. Uh, a few questions for, for Mr. Gobble. Sure. Um, can you uh, provi provide us with uh, kind of the status of what uh, engineering, uh, you know, needs to be done uh, or planning, you know, for, uh, for the Fair Park Phase 2 or, or and also what all has been done for that work so far? Um, yes, Commissioner. Uh, Basically, first of all, Fair Park Phase Two. There was actually a little bit of work done in that area. It's part of the Expo project where we did provide some area for stormwater to be retained uh, in the Phase Two area. But uh, the main thing that's involved in that is the construction of a greenway and sidewalks along Craighead, um, and. We've got some concept sketches that have been done uh, where we were looking at the uh, various options to lay, out, to lay out the greenway and how those things may be worked as well as some access, uh, as well as some access areas. All of that is very much in the concept along with any of the modifications to that service road that's kind of going up uh, along the south end of the speedway. All of that is being just kind of, there's some options being analyzed. None of that's been funded or is been gone through a detailed design process. Uh, it's just a matter of if the speedway does expand, which we'll be talking about that in a minute. Um, and if those things, how do you accommodate all that? So some concepts have been done, uh, but nothing has been done to get into the hard design other than trying to figure out how it might work and work with the various stakeholders to get them involved. So that's kind of a convoluted answer, but does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes, in, in a sense. And that's kind of where I was going. I was trying to think it through. I know it's a lot of 
you know, planning and what ifs um, and, and coordination with the other activities on. And I'm just trying to kind of wrap my head around what all is needed moving forward. So thank you for that. And I think it's important to emphasize that before it would go to the next level, um, some significant engineering studies would need to be done in coordination uh, to make sure that that those concepts are applicable. They always re get refined over the as you go through that process. Yeah, uh, I, I guess I'll just add, and you know, I guess my my personal feelings is, you know, I want it. I want this. Uh, I know there's been conversations with this, and obviously with the coordination, and scheduling, and construction with uh, possible speedway renovations and uh, roads, etc. Um, and, and that portion of the property. But uh, you know, my personal feelings is, you know, I want to decouple this with from you know any any speedway uh conversations um and you know uh, want to see this funded and finished uh, in line with the uh you know with the original envisioned uh, uh site plan um uh, I, I guess and and also add to that i know we have you know the mayor's office on the line but you know i think it'd be important for our board to you know express uh our support of of the funding of such and uh and uh and chair and the rest of board members i'd be curious to hear your thoughts if we could send a uh, maybe a letter of support uh from from the board uh through through the chair through laura um would be kind of my my uh i guess uh, suggestion for for consideration commissioner hammer i can uh, i think this might be a question for alex but i believe at this point we can individually send um letters but we should have an official agenda item to make that decision at the next meeting to send it as a board yeah, this is this is Alex. I think that um, the certainly individuals you can do it in your individual capacity, but um, yeah, given that you you want to have an agenda item for that kind of thing, but it's something that could be drafted and ready for a vote at the next meeting. Okay, perfect. Any further questions? All right, great. Let's move on then to MLS Stadium update. I believe we're going to hear from Ms. Kavara on this. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners, and I will try to share my screen right now. Um, hopefully you can see this and we'll get into some pictures in a, a couple minutes. Um, my name is Mary Kavara. I'm here today on behalf of Nashville SC. I'll provide a brief update on the stadium construction. The stadium construction continues to move ahead as scheduled. The installation of the steel beams began at the end of January and continues through the spring. In addition, the, co the construction crews are continuing to pour concrete in the lower bowl seating areas, as well as the club and the concourse areas. Looking ahead, the next major milestone is the steel canopy beginning in late spring. And I'm also pleased to report that the DBE participation has pretty much leveled out at approximately 36%, which exceeds the um, targeted goal in the contract of 30%. And now I'll share a few recent uh, aerial shots uh, of the site. These two sites, or the, the picture on the lower right is looking to orient you, looking towards downtown Nashville. And you can see some of the steel at the back of the bowl, and that's really where the back of the house is and uh, locker rooms, uh, storage areas, and things like that. Um, and then if you look at uh, the picture on the upper left, you can begin to see some of the concrete on the right side of the concourse. And I think that begins to give you a perspective that how wide these concourses will be so that we can safely accommodate our 30,000 fans. And, and then towards the bottom of the bowl, you can begin to see some of the concrete that's poured for the seating. These two shots come in a little bit closer where you can uh, again see those materials. You can see the large cranes that are involved with the steel work there. And uh, this last site or this last photo again shows the seating on the left side there. That's really where the um, premium areas are going to be with the three different clubs. And then above that, them will be the suites and um, 
other areas and then uh, the seeding bowl, they will continue to pour uh, around the remainder of the bowl and then they will uh, pour the seeding that's directly in front of the steel beams uh, towards the very end. And before I turn it over to the next presenter, I will pause here to see if there's any questions. And if not, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Mrs. Kavara. Okay, next up we have Speedway Motorsports. So before I hand it over to, I believe, Mr. Caldwell, who's here with us today, I want to recap for everyone that as of the last meeting, we had a more formal introduction to the potential deal from both the mayor's office and from Mr. Caldwell with SMI. Um, at that meeting, we decided that each board member would meet individually with the folks from Speedway Motorsports to get an overview and an update on the project. And I believe that all those meetings are now complete. So we'll get an update from Mr. Caldwell on those meetings and where we stand today. Mr. Caldwell. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members. Appreciate you guys um, allowing me to join you this morning. And we very much appreciate the partnership uh, with Mayor Cooper and fair board members and, and um, Director Laura Womack on being able to advance um, this partnership potentially. And we agree very much with uh, what Mayor Cooper has shared that there's just a tremendous opportunity to restore this historic speedway to prominence as a national and international jewel in motorsports. Uh, the place has such an abundance history and reverence in the auto racing industry and there's terrific potential uh, to deliver on that, uh, as Mayor Cooper has described, creating an entertainment venue that can add to the community and, and be something that everyone can be proud of. We are currently uh, focused in three areas as we've um, been asked by the mayor's office to do. First has been uh, working with planning, planners and engineers on the physical renovation of the raceway and the connectivity and holistic approach to the surrounding environment uh, and incorporating that with mixed use and soccer, the Expo Center and others. Uh, we do have some conceptual drawings that we've been uh, working with. Um, those drawings have come from conversations with Mr. Sturdivant and Mr. Gobble and um, Ms. Hawkins. And working with Laura, uh, we've discussed that these should be shared and reviewed by other Metro stakeholders and then um, have that to review with others. So we look forward to being able to do that hopefully at the next fair board meeting. Um, we've also been asked for stakeholder and community engagement. So uh, as Madam Chair referenced, we have met with all the fair board members, uh, Councilman Sledge and other council members. We very much appreciate the time uh, that all of those have given and certainly heard from the fair board on, um, on their focuses and the importance of the impact on the neighborhoods and the communities, uh, the importance of the Speedway fitting into the overall plan at the fairgrounds property and the importance of a long-term viable solution and business model at the Speedway. We are uh, continuing to pull together information to answers to the specific questions that the uh, board members asked and uh, have that to them very soon. We are working with Laura to set up community meetings and with neighborhoods and agencies. We expect uh, to have that schedule and uh, pass that along to the board very soon. And uh, we are ready to begin those conversations immediately. We did have a meeting scheduled uh, last week with Miss Kelly and Stand Up Nashville. And unfortunately, um, she needed to postpone that. So we're trying to reschedule that and hope to do that very soon. Uh, we've had several great meetings with uh, Market Street and uh, last week with Market Street and MLS, uh, we hope to have another meeting with Market Street this week to continue those conversations. Um, and then our third uh, focus has been due diligence uh, with the city on kind of the, the structure of a concept, contractual agreement and any um, what that could look like as we move forward. Uh, we also continue to have outreach to um, national sanctioning bodies and local racing stakeholders. We've had good conversations with the current operator there, uh, Bob Sargent and others in the racing community um, and continue to look forward to their feedback. 
And again, we thank you for um, the time that you've all given to this and uh, look forward to continuing these conversations. I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Questions for Mr. Clark? Okay, great. Um, thank you again for your time. We appreciate it. And uh, I do believe Mr. Sturdivant um, is with us. He may have something he wants to add. Great, Mr. Sturdivant. Yeah, I'll make a, a few comments. Um, it's very similar to what uh, Mr. Caldwell said, but what we've, we've been doing in the last month or so is working with their development people to see what kind of modifications or adjustments we might need to make on uh, the plans we already have to fit their program in uh, to be able to accommodate them. And then we coordinate that with Market Street and the, um, the stadium project and the infrastructure project. And um, so far, uh, you know, the, the adjustments that we're looking at are pretty minor. Uh, they're, you know, something that we think we can do and accommodate most of them are still on paper so they haven't been built yet so they're you know this is the time to make those adjustments um we've had one thing that's you know a little problematic uh we have to move some nes uh infrastructure and we've started meeting with them and to see what that requires so you know i think it pretty promising and uh we'll just keep uh, going through this process um and uh you know Hopefully it'll uh, result in a good project. So um, happy to answer any questions. Mr. Sturdivant, hey, this is Commissioner Bergeron. I do have a couple of questions we didn't have a chance to meet uh, dur uh, during during my time with SMI and, and uh, my meeting with my. So I'm trying to understand some of the design cues that, I, that they indicated to me were made by the mayor's office. Um, um, it helped me understand um, sort of where the design is heading on that south end of the track and, and adding a pretty significant structure over there that's going to uh, cut into Fair Park that exists. Uh, it helped me understand sort of the, the, the decision making and design process there. Yeah, I, I, the stuff that I've been working on hasn't, in, hasn't included, I haven't gotten that far yet. Um, so, I'm really not that familiar uh, with what you're uh, referring to. The, the stuff that the you know we've been working with mostly is uh, how uh, the, the area in between Market Street and the the grandstands, that concourse, and then uh, the access road uh, that runs behind Turn One, um, and then the. Uh, NES and the other utilities that are coming into the site. That's kind of where our focus has been. Um, there may be somebody else on the on the call that is more familiar with that, but that's where my focus has been. I, I, I was I was told that the ble new bleachers along Turn One, which which kind of expand a lot big larger than two renderings I saw last year, were were your were the mayor's office's design choice. So I'm just trying to. Uh, understand that um, um, but but as to the the division between um, the the Market Street project behind the, behind the grandstands just confirming so it's it's my understanding that that the existing grandstands are going to be almost entirely demolished correct uh, as the plan is going right now that's that's what we're hearing yeah okay so that's going to be demolished the tracks going to be track surface is going to be demolished Pretty much everything that's there is going to be is going to be demolished. I think that's more of a question for Mr. Caldwell. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to be confusing there. I, 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 I those those things when we were discussing my meeting were directed to the mayor's office. So I, I'm just trying to figure out where, what's what. That so thank you. Can I? This is this is Ron Gobble. Can I clarify a couple of items here? Sure. Uh, um, Commissioner Bergeron, I, what we've been trying to do is to work with the design team of SMI and say, what do you need? What would you like to have this work and make it fit in with all the other areas that have been either designed or already under construction. And we're essentially 
saying those things really can't move, we might be able to do small adjustments. Um, so we've been working with the Market Street people on their mixed use project. And they have a parking garage as well as uh, future residential and retail materials and trying to make sure those things relate as best we can. Uh, the SMI has asked and said that the turn one grandstands would be important to them to make this racetrack successful. Anything inside of that loop has been We've been working with their design team about what do they need to make it work. We're not experts in speedways as they are. Um, we asked Hawkins partners to say, all right, if we put a grandstand on that in turn one, what would that mean? And one of the things that's as this campus evolves, We've all looked at that one lane bridge that goes across Browns Creek that services that road as part of Fair Park. And we said in order to accommodate that, that road would have to shift a little bit to the left and be regraded so we could get ADA access and some other things and get improved the accessibility up from Browns Creek and Craighead up to the, uh, to the area between the grandstands and the mixed use. That would de decrease some of that little triangular area down there that's in phase one of Fair Park. Uh, but it was a concept. We're not really necessarily saying that's what's going to happen. We're just saying that that's one way you accommodate these. Um, one way you accommodate these additional grandstands. If we get to that point, then we've got to talk to parks. We've got to talk to Metro Water. We're trying to set those other stakeholders up to say, how does this design impact you? But I don't want to imply that that's necessarily going to be the optimum solution. It is just a solution at this point, knowing that whatever you do there will um, take some compromises on everybody's part but are they acceptable and can we use that as a way to, for example, make a two lane bridge, make that road more accessible and make it more ADA accessible. Uh, but if you do that, you do lose a little bit of that part. So that's, that's a study that we're involved. I don't wanna imply that anybody's saying that's definitely gonna happen. It's just a way to accommodate the uh, request of SMI to get a grandstands on turn one. Thanks, uh -huh. Ron. That's really, that's helpful clarification. And I guess I would just throw out there, since everybody's conceptualizing, since since the entire facility is being demolished, including the grandstands, you know, maybe we should consider whether the existing grandstands footprint, which is being replaced since it's all being torn down, maybe would go go up, right? Um, uh, maybe that maybe that could be considered as a uh, as an option where um, maybe, and, and I'm, I'm just, I'm getting to a point of maybe, <laughs> Uh, thinking about the, the almost <laughs> the enclosing benefit of, of having a taller grandstand that could help uh, contain sound a little bit more. Um, just just throwing that out there. Uh, if you know, and would be happy to talk about that. You know, more concepts with you. I appreciate that it's it's all um, rendering, but since it's all, it's just an entirely new facility being built, uh, just throwing that out there. One other question I did have, Ron, while I have you is. Um, if memory serves, um, and this is a question I'd, uh, I'd asked in my follow-up questions after my meeting with SMI, if memory serves, aren't there some stormwater uh, uh, pre uh, related uh, work that was done sort of between effectively turn one area and the soccer stadium that would, if they, if there were, uh, a concept that involved building bleachers on turn one that would be uh, sort of affected or would have to be reworked then in that regard? Uh, well, there's there's several stormwater uh, remediation areas in that area, but the that are designed and under construction as part of the stadium. Um, this concept that you've seen essentially preserves all of those without really making any substantive change. 
Um, it may take some regrading, but not not moving drainage elements and all that. Now, that being said, stormwater issues are going to be a major concern with the speedway rework. And one of my jobs right now is to try to set up a meeting with SMI and the stormwater people and their design team and get the engineers again in the room and say, how do we how do we in concept anyway solve these issues? But stormwater is going to be a big issue. It's always been on this area of Browns Creek. Uh, so that everything we do actually improves the stormwater situation versus versus the opposite of that. And <clears throat> so we're trying to set up a meeting with Public Works and Metro Water um, in the next week or so with SMI's design team so we can start saying how do we conceptually solve all these issues and our, there's engineering solutions they all cost money and so the question is how does that how does that impact the overall performance of the of the project and um, it's from an engineering perspective it's extremely complicated understood i appreciate the uh, the time ron and i'll, I'll be sure to forward any other questions I have on, on that to you. Um, one other thing, Chair McNeil, I just wanted to compliment uh, the, the, the voice commitment Mr. Caldwell made to me during my meeting that, that they, they understand the sort of race volume now and that second bucket, which are tr now what we call track rentals, which would be sort of these ancillary events. And I still have some questions about, about ancillary events as, as I've voiced in other meetings, but I, I appreciated Mr. Caldwell and Mr. Weaver's statement to me that their plan involves less days per year of, of those two activities than are happening now. And I think that that's uh, an important principle. I appreciate that. I think devil's in the details. We need to figure out how to place hard limits and then have the appropriate financial guarantees for a uh, for the debt obligations here to ensure that that those use limits are, are hard and observed and don't create a second uh, uh, need for a second set of schedules to make up any debt obligations. Um, so we'd definitely be looking for financial guarantees like we got from soccer here. Um, but but it was, in, was in, we do want to compliment and encourage that there was recognition that the uh, the impact from races and ancillary events, track rentals would, would, would have to decrease. And I, I appreciated that principle being recognized. Thanks, Commissioner Bergeron. Do we have any other questions from the board? Okay, great. Um, I do want to say um, for Mr. Caldwell and Mr. Sturdivant, um, in terms of timeline, I know this is my the thing I keep harping on, but if if we can get an overview of because clearly everyone listening knows there are a million chess pieces in this, um, if we could get some potential timelines to know when we might be seeing agreements across our desks. I think that would be really, really helpful. Um, I know I know there's a lot of moving parts, but just letting us know um, know what we need to be looking for would be really helpful. And if we have no other questions from the board, I believe we have Councilman Young here with us. Yes, Madam Chair, and, and, and thank you. Um, and. Uh, Thanks all of you and, and good morning. Um, I will say I've been sitting here this morning uh, drinking my coffee very carefully. And of course, just a moment ago is when I decided to spill some on my shirt. So I adjusted my camera accordingly so as not to embarrass myself. But uh, um, I represent a district that is a little further out in the county, uh, but it's a district full of people that um, love the fairgrounds property and i just wanted to join y'all this morning and and voice my support of uh, this agreement and partnership that, that's in the works but before i say anything more about that i do want to take one minute and, and piggyback off of some comments that my um colleague on the council but really my friend councilman uh colby sledge said uh, regarding the, the funding for, for Fair Park, um, I think we can all agree that the fairgrounds overall for more than uh, more than a decade has, has been a um, 
political hot cake or, or third rail of national politics, it seems. And um, there's been a lot of um, debate and tension. And, you know, what we've ended up with is a piecemeal attempt at trying to make this property work for everyone. And I think that if we can uh, take this last part of Fair Park and uh, our new partner, um, SMI and Bristol with the racetrack. And I, I think if we all try to work together and, and get a comprehensive financing package together for all of this, then we can settle the redevelopment concerns of the fairgrounds property and get this property complete and um, shining and, and great for not just those that enjoy coming to the property, uh, but especially for those in Councilman Sledge's district that live nearby so they can continue to enjoy Fair Park and we can finish the, the multitude of critical infrastructure uh, projects and upgrades that need to happen there on the property. Uh, so I, I don't think it's very presumptuous of me to say that I have no doubt that the entire council um, is supportive of the completion of Fair Park and I'm, I look forward to how we can find a way to uh, get that included as part of a comprehensive um, financing plan this year to finally make that happen so that uh, we can move on and have a, a property that's, that is just a crown jewel for, for everybody. Excuse me. Um, now, when it, when it comes to uh, the discussion at hand this morning with Mr. Caldwell and the folks at Bristol Motor Speedway and, and SMI, I just, I felt personally obligated to join this morning and, and, and voice my support, um, not just for my district, which is full of, of people who are race fans and full of people who enjoy uh, using the racetrack and coming to it, but personally is someone who I grew up as a child, actually, um, going to the track every weekend with my dad. And uh, it, it's a very important uh, priority for me to see that uh, now that we are finally as a city putting the focus and investment on the fairgrounds that we should have been doing the last 20 and 30 years, um, that we don't live, leave out the racetrack, especially with it being such an incredibly historic um, landmark, not just in the city, but in the country. Um, you know, I actually have a license plate on the front of my truck. This is Winston Cup Series Racing. And those who are at all familiar with racing and with NASCAR will, will know that um, back in the day, as we say, this track was a, just a, uh, and I've used this term already, but a crown jewel. And it was, it was a great thing that drew people here to the city. And there were great, um, history made for drivers that would later go on and, and drive in the, in the cup series in NASCAR. And Unfortunately, we've uh, we've ignored our obligations to keeping up the track, and I'm excited that uh, a few weeks ago the folks at SMI reached out to me. I guess recognizing that I'm such a fan and a uh, uh, loyal supporter of the track, they reached out to me and they shared with me uh, their vision and, and what they're hoping to accomplish and how they want to partner with the city and. I've been absolutely tickled, and I think the people of Nashville will be excited for this. I know the people in my district will, um, but I'm especially excited because from the conversation I had, uh, they understand that flexibility is going to be necessary for all the parties involved. I think as we were just hearing, um, it's exciting and, and interesting for us to muse about the design and different features and engineering, but Luckily, uh, 
there are great professionals at Metro Water, Metro Stormwater, and Public Works, and the Fair Board and SMI that can work together and work out all of those smaller details to make sure that this is a property that's going to uh, not impede on our, our streams and stormwater infrastructure, and then also uh, not impede on the other uses at the property. Um, I really appreciate that about SMI and reaching out and uh, wanting to set up these community meetings and meeting with the different stakeholders and realizing that uh, what happens at this property does not just affect uh, the neighboring uh, residents and businesses, but it's truly a property that affects our entire county and it's something we should all be proud of. So I, I won't carry on much longer. I just want to join you all this morning and voice my support and say how excited I am, especially at a time when I think everyone is ready to um, finish the redevelopment of the entire fairgrounds property. And I think this is a great partner to come in and help us accomplish that. And I think it's going to complement the other uses at the fairgrounds, such as MLS and the Expo Center. And we're gonna have a great, great opportunity out here to really have a, uh, a fairgrounds that has something for everyone who lives here in Nashville. So I, Madam Chair, I, I thank you for the opportunity to join y'all this morning. And uh, I thank y'all for your service to the city. I know that uh, you often don't hear that enough um, you often only hear complaints and stuff from people because I know that uh, Councilman Sledge and myself both uh, certainly have that same sentiment sometimes when it comes to the council. So uh, I, I thank you all very much. Councilman Young, we really appreciate you being here with us and, and thank you for sharing your thoughts and I really hope that coffee stain comes out for you. <laughs> Do we have any questions from the board for Councilman Young? I don't have a question for for Councilman Young. I do have a quick word or two I'd like to pile on. Okay. Thank you. This is Commissioner Weiner. Um, you know, I learned a long time ago uh, that using my two ears and one mouth serve a purpose. And I, at this point, I think it's a little bit premature for me to pile on with opinions and thought until I see um, concrete information. I will share that I am really appreciative of the folks with Bristol spending so, so much time with us over the last uh, 10 days or so, giving us the information and, and mostly listening to what it is that um, we were concerned about and what we wanted to see put on the forefront of this. Um, having been on the council and represented a really diverse community, um, I think it's extraordinarily important that we encourage and insist on robust community engagement. And um, I stressed that when I met with y'all and um, also synergy of all the folks that are gonna be having a place at the fairgrounds table, if you will. So um, again, I really appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Um, I am hopeful that it is a partnership that everyone benefits in, and um, most importantly, the community as it stands right now. So again, I just, I really appreciate everything that everybody's doing to try to bring this to fruition. Thank you, Commissioner Weiner. We, we appreciate those thoughts as well and, and echo them. Um, we, we really do, do appreciate all the hard work that SMI has put in the past few weeks and, um, and, and engaging us and, and look forward to further engaging that being said, before we move on, so about two years ago as a board, we tapped Vice Chair Bergeron to be the point person with SMI. Um, and he's done a great job of that and we really appreciate his commitment on that venture. Um, at this juncture, I'd like to open up the conversation to potentially look at restructuring this. Um, I think it might make sense for me as board chair to take on that role of being the main point of contact, but I wanna open that up for conversation. Obviously, we need the input of each and every board member here, and we all bring different expertise and passions to the project. Um, 
one one area of my expertise um, from my education is conflict negotiation, um, and I would love to be able. I, there's there's so much synergy already here, but there is going to be some conflict to be negotiated. So I'd like to open up the the floor to the board to have that conversation um, to see if folks have thoughts there. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, this is Commissioner Hammer. Um, I, I appreciate it. Uh, I think, and I, I concur. I think uh, uh, Commissioner Bergeron has uh, is, is done very well in, um, in, in navigating the different contractual issues we've had. And, um, and I think your comments around, uh, you know, kind of the, the, the different phase we're going into. And I, I just, you know, I think it's appropriate for the chair to, to you know, handle these discussions. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, I think just to be able to keep an open dialogue conversations, you know, or individual meetings we have that uh, we started this this cadence on and, and allowing the individual board members to, to uh, share their input with uh, with staff and, and uh, um, the different stakeholders, including uh, uh, Bristol and the uh, city and, and community leaders, et cetera, uh, is, is important moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Commissioner Hammer. Uh, any other thoughts? Uh, this is Commissioner Bergeron. I'll, I'll chime in. I, I wasn't aware this was was coming, uh, and so uh, uh, you know, um, I, I'm not I'd be curious about the origins of this a little bit. Uh, not, you know, I, I uh, uh, appreciate um, all the work we've done together as a board on this. Um, um, I, I do, I do think that obviously I've been a uh, I've expressed some concerns uh, about the path the, dis the discussions have taken and, and have pushed for them to go public to be more transparent as they are now. Um, um, but uh, I'm just a little curious as to, as to the timing of this. I think I have some pretty specific concerns and, and a long history of, of involvement in asking those questions and uh, would just uh, have a little bit of a concern about getting some of those items addressed in these discussions. Um, uh, going forward, um, but happy to have that. Happy to have that discussion about this. That, sorry, that, that, I just wanted to add. There's no. There's no origin to it. It's just uh, I've been thinking a lot about it, and in those meetings that we had with SMI, um, I, obviously everyone needs to be communicating with SMI about their own thoughts and feelings. This is um, this is huge, and you've done an amazing job of representing. Um, your expertise and passion to them over the years. It, it's, it's, I just wanted to open the floor for that discussion. Um, as chair, you know, uh, Chairman Horton, former Chairman Horton was um, in charge as chair of the MLS discussions. Um, and we decided that because he was chair. So I, I wanted to bring that forward for discussion with the board. There's no, um, there's no conspiracy there. No, no, it's not at all. Didn't, <laughs> didn't, didn't mean to suggest that at all, Chair yeah. McAnally. Just more wanted to have a kind of open discussion about it. I obviously think I carry a lot of the uh, community concern input, and the community has pretty substantial concerns about this. Um, Absolutely. And and so I just want to ensure that those those are still brought to the fore. I, I want to ensure that uh, as part of the, the robust uh, community engagement process that hasn't even started yet, which I agree with Commissioner Weiner needs to occur. Um, and I've already listed dozens of community organizations. Um, but just in, in bringing that to the fore and bringing those considerations to the fore, I just want to ensure that that's still going to be a, a pathway. Um, uh, so that that's that's my priority for whoever the uh, whoever the uh, official board representative is. Absolutely. And it's a priority for me, for everyone to individually have a voice as a board and for when we make decisions as a board, for those to be um, the voice of the board as well. So I, I, I certainly um, would would always want your uh, opinion um, and your voice in that. This is Commissioner Weiner. I'd like to chime in if that's okay. Yes, um, of course. I really appreciate everything Commissioner Bergeron has done. I think you have brought um, fabulous and insightful um, insight, for lack of a better word, um, into 
all the information that you have shared with us and, and the concerns that you've brought forward. Um, I also would like to look at structure and history, and I like to look at continuity. And if you look at some of the other boards and commissions that we have across Metro government, um, for example, Sports Authority, um, the chair is who typically um, pioneers, leads, controls, manages um, these contractual engagements. And so I think it's more than appropriate for Commissioner McNally to be the one handling um, these things at this juncture, um, but certainly not to dilute um, by any sense the um, insight and the um, input of any of the commissioners that are serving. Thank you, Commissioner Weiner. I believe procedurally we would have to take a vote here. I think I'd have to make the mo I think we'd have to make the motion first, right? And, and I'm right, happy, right, right. And I'm, and I'm happy to make the motion that that uh, Commissioner McAnally um, will act as the uh, board representative uh, for negotiating any, any agreements if, if we get to that point um, with uh, with uh, SMI regarding a new speedway facility to be constructed on the fairgrounds. Second. This commissioner will second. Thank you very much. Do we have any discussion now? Okay, well, Commissioner Bergeron, um, I assure you, um, and I, I know I can't speak to you outside of meetings, but, <laughs> but I will do my very best to make sure that um, any thoughts and, and um, ideas that you have are, and, and that goes for everybody on the board, that they are represented um, and um, really appreciate uh, appreciate you all. So we'll take a verbal roll call, or sorry, ver verbal vote here. Uh, Commissioner Hammer. Commissioner Hammer, aye. Commissioner Bergeron. Aye. Commissioner Weiner. Aye. And I, Commissioner McNally, am also aye. Thank you very much. Okay, moving on to new business. We have community benefits agreement. Laura, do you want to give us an overview here? I, I will. Thank you so much. It's Laura Womack. Um, so this was a requested uh, addition to the agenda by a board member. Um, I, sorry, as always, when I'm up at some point, my dogs go nuts. So I apologize. Um, so the Community of Benefits Agreement is a contractual arrangement between Nashville Soccer Holdings and Stand Up Nashville. And certainly while the Fair Board and other metro agencies do have a vested interest in the outcome of this arrangement and have absolutely shown their support um, for this arrangement when it was discussed back in you know 2018 when we went through all the agreements um, certainly Metro Council it was a priority for the administration and for the council as well um, we are not a party to the agreement um, from a Metro standpoint and from a fair board um, certainly does not dilute our interest in making sure that we are aware that provisions within the CBA um, are realized. That said, there are a lot of pieces and parts to the CBA. And so as, as response to the request that this be added, um, my thought is um, at the pleasure of the board to kind of discuss how you would like to see discussions around the CBA handled in, in future meetings and how you would like to see that set up um, so that, uh, you know, I can make arrangements for um, updates as the board sees fit. Any thoughts from the board here? This is Commissioner Weiner. I think that it makes sense for us to be kept apprised of anything that's concrete that would affect um, our decision making and just in terms of being aware and being able to offer um, our suggestion and thought, I think it'd be appropriate for us to get routine updates. Yeah, this is Commissioner Bergeron. Um, I would... Uh, 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 I would love to hear, you know, 
concrete information uh, about how, how things are going. I think it's going to be um, helpful. I mean, I think obviously uh, this commission and the Metro Council all ex broadly expressed support that uh, the, the overall totality of the, the soccer and mixed-use project was approved. Um, was was color the, that approval was colored by the, the knowledge that this private agreement had been done, and so I think that the the, the fact that it it has you know a host of components included, I, I I would I would like to hear periodic updates from from the stakeholders about about how that's going, and I think that that's going to be uh, good just for us to know and to feel comfort with, and then I think it's also going to be good because. You know, we're not. We're going to have multiple community benefits agreements. There's, there's going to have. I mean, I, I, there's going to have to be one. I would imagine for any agreement, if if we get to an agreement as to a new speedway facility being constructed. So, um, you know, I, I would like to receive uh, pretty regular updates. And um, uh, and you know, I also wouldn't mind hearing from Miss Kelly um, about you know just progress and whatnot, and maybe hear if she has any suggestions as to uh, the kind of updates she or information she might be willing to give to the board periodically as, as these things start to come to fruition. Great. Uh, Alex, as a matter of procedure with this, does it make sense? I'm trying to think through the how we might structure it from an agenda standpoint, if we would have a freestanding item or if it would make most sense to have it um, associated with, you know, the MLS and mixed use update and the, um, and the SMI updates. You can do it either way. This okay. is Alex Dickerson. Okay. Do we have any thoughts on that from the board? What we think might be the, the best procedure there? This is Commissioner Hammer. Uh, I mean, I'm open to all years. I know it's, uh, you know, it's a long, uh, it, you know, there's a lot of things to be negotiated and a lot of back and forth. So I don't, uh, you know, want it to be a, you know, anything contentious by any means. I think maybe if uh, if the parties, you know, as part of, uh, you know, Laura's update or the, the uh, overall Speedway update, you know, if, uh, if we could get someone to provide, uh, you know, either on behalf of the racetrack or behalf of uh, operations, you uh, uh, you know, or Miss Kelly's group, uh, Stamp, excuse me, Stamp Nashville, that we could get get some of those updates. I think that would be probably the most succinct and efficient efficient manner. And if the board members, you know, have questions, we can uh, we can ask them at the meeting. Okay, great. Any other thoughts here? Miss Kelly, are you still with us? It looks like she's still here. Hello, can anyone hear me? Yes. Do you, would you would you like to share any thoughts you might have on on updates for us? Well, I mean the um, I, I know right now the question of is where and how you would fit this into it. I mean I think um, this is a has a bigger comp uh, community input comp uh, component to it. So I don't know if it would make sense to uh, put it into like the overall director's report or to have it included within the mixed use or the stadium, given that there are specific guidelines around the CBA. I think it'd be best if it was just a standalone uh, item. Um, we can be prepared and be here for every um, um, board meeting going forward to give an update. Okay, great. Any thoughts from the board? Ms. Kavara, did you have something you'd like to add? Sure, I think that, um, and and thank you, and, and I am speaking on behalf of, of Nashville Soccer Holdings that um, Commissioner Bergeron asked if, if there was an update, and, and just to kind of remind folks at a high level what the primary areas of focus are in the community benefits agreement that Nashville Soccer Holdings signed with uh, Stand Up Nashville back in September of 2018. And they include diversity, affordable housing, jobs, workforce development, inclusive spaces, and youth. 
Certain of these items relate to the mixed use development, which is in the design stage, as you heard at the January uh, board meeting. And many of the youth activities were really not possible to implement uh, during this past year because of the pandemic. However, we did contribute over 500 volunteer hours. Uh, a mini soccer pitch was completed in 2019 at the Magruder Family Center. Um, and as I've shared at prior meetings, uh, the club has participated in many community initiatives such as tornado cleanup, uh, the mask distribution, food delivery, and school supplies. And um, that, and, and also as a reminder that this agreement really just became effective in 2020 because that's the first year that we were actually playing as an MLS club. Um, and, you know, we're pleased to provide uh, updates as, as we move forward, but uh, that was kind of a, a quick synopsis for today. And please let me know if there's any questions. Any questions from the board? Okay, I don't, I don't believe, Alex, you can correct me if I'm wrong, we don't need to take a vote here. We can just, perhaps um, Laura and I will figure out a potential um, way to move forward with the agenda. That's correct. Okay, okay, great. Then if it's okay with the board, then we will we'll discuss options there and, and propose something that Laura will send you um, before the next meeting. Hey, this is Commissioner Bergeron. I just wanted to make a pitch. I, I, it, doesn't, it seems like just like we get other reports, it might be a good idea just to have this also be a, a report we receive. And if there's nothing concrete to report, there might not be anything to report, but it just seems like this might be another good another good report to receive for, for information's sake. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Guevara, and thank you, Odessa Kelly. Okay. Next we have Neighborhood Impact Advisory Committee update. Thank you. It's Laura Womack. Um, I am really pleased to uh, inform the board that we had an initial kickoff meeting for the a new Neighborhood Impact Advisory Committee. And I want to thank Commissioner Bergeron and Councilmember Sledge for their work in recruiting some new members um, from the surrounding neighborhoods. So we met last week. Um, Myself and Scott Wallace and Molly from our events office participated. Uh, Christy Harris, thank you so much for your efforts in setting it up and coordinating everything. And then Bob Sargent, Randy Dice represented the Speedway and Councilman Sledge and Commissioner Bergeron was on the meeting. And we had representation from Russworm Heights, Woody Crest, and my understanding is that we anticipate additional members recruited from Chestnut Hill and 12 South, but I will let um, either Councilman Sledge or Commissioner Bergeron kind of update us on any new members. But there was uh, five members from the surrounding communities. And then we also have the executive director of 50 Forward, um, Sherry Loic, who was um, on the call as well. And so I appreciated her coming on um, as we will need to be in close communication with 50 Forward on um, construction and then events when we start kicking off, um, hopefully this summer with some, some events again. So we talked um, a lot about, you know, what our priorities were and, you know, I think everybody was of the understanding that knowledge is power and that making sure that our community surrounding communities are aware of uh, impacts before they happen. That could be traffic, that could be uh, noise, it could be uh, long events, um, whatever that would be is making sure that they have the information so that they can pass that on to their neighbors and be aware and then also have a mechanism in place up front that we can receive feedback um, in the event there's any challenges and i want to um, thank scott for being very proactive in that regard and giving out his cell phone numbers uh, so that he can be reached in the event somebody has concerns um, after hours so i do want to thank him for that um, there will be reaching out to some of the other groups on campus. Certainly um, participation from the track is essential. Um, 
And then as you know, we progress with discussions from SMI, do anticipate representation from National Soccer Holdings. Um, certainly invite anybody from uh, the mixed use development that would like to participate. And I think, you know, having a, a comprehensive campus wide uh, touch point with the neighbors is is always a good thing. And I will be quiet and turn it over to uh, either Councilman Sledge, if he's still on here, and or Commissioner Bergeron, if they have anything else to add, since they were so instrumental in helping get this set up. Sure, this is Councilmember Sledge. I'll just add in the time since we met. Um, I know that, uh, and I also want to echo the thanks to Commissioner Bergeron. He has done a ton of work in reaching out to community members. Um, I know he had reached out to other neighborhood groups as well. Um, in the time since we met, uh, I got confirmation from the 12 South Neighborhood Association that they have a board member that um, will be um, participating as well. And then I'm going to follow up, um, and I know Commissioner Bergeron will as well, with a couple of the other community uh, groups that have not yet responded. I know there was one that had a um, board, an executive director change on their board during this time. So um, I think now that they've got that um, new person in, that they'll be able to get somebody over to the next meeting. Uh, yeah, this is Commissioner Bergeron. I think I think uh, great, great first meeting. I want to commend um, everybody involved, especially I want to highlight Scott, who, as always, is just uh, just bending over backwards and working his tail off to to uh, be make sure that you know the tie lines and communications are there. Um, uh, you know, I I I, I, I just am, am a big fan of the way Scott does things. I've, I have been I have been since since way back in the day uh, when we first met. So I just want to I want to uh, single out especially how how uh, accommodating uh, he has always been during the ACT meetings, um, and also wanted to recognize. Uh, good updates from Bob Sargent and, and, and Randy Dice on, on and their their efforts for uh, uh, plans for the new season and uh, getting a really tight uh, muffler list uh, in in place uh, that that should show hopefully help with impact um, and and yeah uh, looking forward to getting a few more members on board to really um, cover uh, some other uh, other neighborhoods in, in the surrounding community um, and really looking forward to. Um, NIAC, uh getting getting rolling full steam ahead. Thank you, Commissioner Bergeron, and thank you for all your hard work on this, as well as um, Colby and Laura and Mr. Wallace, as always. Do we have any other questions from the board or comments? All right, great. Then we will move on to our final agenda item which is event update, Laura. Thank you, Laura Womack. Um, so we have two parts to the event update. Certainly I'll turn it over to um, Scott Wallace to update the board on any changes to the event schedule. But we also have a special guest, Ms. Genevieve Loss, who I want to welcome. She is interested in um, an event and we've invited her to give the board a little idea of what that new event could look like, um, especially as it relates to um, pandemic protocols and how we can maybe start looking at doing some, again, outdoor events in a very um, responsible way and making sure that, you know, all of our public health mandates are followed and just good pandemic protocol. Um, moving forward, certainly that we don't know where we're going to be in uh, spring and summer, but it's always obviously a good idea to make those plans um, with most likely reduced capacity with social distancing um, it's still in place. So um, why don't we go ahead and let Scott, if it's okay with you, Chair, we'll go ahead and let Scott give an update and then we can turn it over to Ms. Loss. That works for me. I did want to add that, you know, we, this is coming before the board based on conversations that we had in the fall about the entire board looking at any events that we have. So we wanted to make sure um, that everyone was able to get eyes on this and, 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 and any big events that we'll all be looking at for this period in the pandemic. So I just wanted to clarify that. But Scott, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Commissioner McAnally. And thank you, everyone that's on the call. And I appreciate the uh, 
the well, the great things that you said about our department, and it takes all of us to do it. So I can't take all the responsibility for that. And we thank you all for keeping us uh, accountable and also being uh, having the ears to be able to hear our concerns as well. And 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 so we we know that we all have to work together. So this is this 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 is what we have to do when it comes to the NEAC and anything that we do. Um, as far as any events that we have, uh, we're looking forward to working with uh, Ms. Genevieve on, on her event and then others that's, that are coming up. Of course, as we know that the uh, the indoor events are, have been uh, idle because of the homeless shelter and we hope to be able to get back in by June. We have a lot of people that are right now moving around still i think uh through the whole pandemic has been juggling that that molly and i have done is try to keep everybody happy um we've we've uh gained some events we've lost some events of course people are are you know concerned about what's going to happen as far as the pandemic in the near future so they are starting to move things back even in 2022 however we're going to be positive and, and and continue to uh push forward because you know, one of the things that you all have uh, hired me to do is make sure that we make money for this uh, for for the city. So we are working hard at that. We are do, being very uh, uh, thoughtful in what we do, and, and also so we appreciate the board, especially uh, dealing with bigger events, being able to lend a hand to us and be able to understand what's going on. And just like it was mentioned before, I think uh, the important thing that we have understood about this. I think Laura mentioned is that being forth in the forefront and being forthright with events. So I think the neighbors are um, more concerned about that. If we had, if they know what's going on, then you know they they don't seem to be as upset. And so we're going to make sure that continues to happen and, and and build on that and continue to do that. So didn't have much to say because we don't have anything going on this month. Or in March, but in April, we're going to ramp up with some races and and some other things coming up. So uh, we're excited about that, and you'll hear more about that in the future. Thank you. Any questions? I'm I'm, I'm here. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Any questions? Okay, great. Then we can turn it over to Genevieve Bloss and Darren Lashinsky from NS2. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you board members for having us here. We're very excited to talk to you about our idea for socially distanced outdoor shows at Fair Park. Let me attempt to share the deck with you that I believe all of the board members have been able to look at. Um, and we'll just kind of fly through it since you guys have been able to see this already and go through what we are proposing. Um, so in fall of 2020, we were able to launch an outdoor socially distanced concert series at The Bend in Charleston, South Carolina, along the Ashley River. This photo is one of the pictures taken as people are starting to ingress and set up in their socially distanced pods there, um, right along the river, spaced out completely along about a 300 foot um, from the front of the stage to the back of the pods which is something similar that we want to implement in the Fair Park. Um, I'm here with Darren Lashinsky, who is a president at NS2. Welcome, Darren. Good morning. Um, I'm uh, president of NS2 and partner in our overall company is Frank Productions. We have offices here in Nashville. I've been based here for 28 years. Um, we promote shows um, at the Ryman, and Bridgestone Arena, and we have a long-term partnership with Kyle Young and the Country Music Hall of Fame. We have offices in South Carolina, Missouri, and Wisconsin, and we own and operate seven venues as well. What we were able to do last fall in Charleston was 11 um, nights of outdoor, safe, socially distanced, um, concerts that were approved by the governor, approved by local authorities. We worked with the local health department to make sure that everything was as contactless as possible, as safe as possible, and as fun as possible to allow an audience to come out, enjoy themselves, kind of feel like they're getting back to a normal life in a safe manner while providing a diverse lineup of both national and local touring artists. Um, we were able to see over 10,000 guests there this fall. 
and hoping to, to see a similar return to some music in Nashville. Um, oh, I'm skipping around, sorry. In at Fair Park, this is our proposed layout. Um, everything is able to be moved around, but this gives you the general idea of setting up the stage that the sound shed and the sound blows into that kind of dirt hill that's under where the soccer stadium is going in at to help alleviate some of the sound shed issues that are gonna be at, at the park. So we can contain that as much as possible. This has 368 seven by seven foot pods where guests of four can go and will enter as a group, go to their pod and then have their designated restrooms and concession area to go to, to help alleviate crowds, to make sure that we can contain socially distanced lines. Um, we will have sanitation stations set up all over the grounds. We will have ingress and egress that are timed and able to keep guests based and maintain that safety. Um, our initial idea is to start with a 10 concert series um, on weekends and launch it in April and go through June or July. Um, we understand that we are in a neighborhood, in a residential area. Our offices are actually in Berry Hill on Iris Drive. So we completely understand the neighborhood and wanna be conscientious of working with the Neighborhood Impact Advisory Committee and making sure that we are good neighbors to the people that are living in the area and they feel that this is a part of their community and not something forced upon them so that we can be something that they're proud to have in their area. Um, guest experiences, we were able to really flesh out these ideas and work with health departments in South Carolina. So we feel very confident in being able to communicate with guests when they're buying their tickets, when they're arriving on site in pre-show emails to make sure that they know what's expected and how they can be safe at our events. We will over communicate with guests and over staff our events so that everyone can maintain a safe social distance. They will be required to wear face masks when ingressing and egressing and we'll work with the public health department to decide on whether masks will be required the entire time people will be on site. Um, we'll be using cashless concessions and mobile ticketing so that there's no passing of anything from guests to staff. We'll be doing temperature check checks upon arrival and making sure that we maintain all COVID-19 protocols that are mandated by local officials, state officials, national officials. Um, we'll make sure that our artists and backstage crew are also following a stringent guideline on safety standards and requiring that they all are masked, all are getting temperature checked, um, have limited access so that we spread out our load in times and make sure that we can keep as few staff in the same area as possible and make sure that all of our team members understand the COVID protocols, are able to work with the health department, are able to work with our guests to just maintain a really safe environment so people are able to come out and enjoy themselves again. And that is our initial idea. We want to present something to you guys so that you are comfortable, that you feel like the fairgrounds are represented well, and so that we can maintain a good relationship that can you know, hopefully develop into something that becomes a, a long-term partnership with you all. Thank you, Genevieve and Darren. Um, before we open it up for questions, I just wanted to say, uh, for what it's worth, as uh, as a commissioner with um, concert background, I have worked with NS2 in the past, and they are fantastic. Um, you also know, I'm as a board, that I'm very nervous about events um, <laughs> in in the era of COVID, and so um, I, I want to have a, an open and honest conversation about how we're all feeling about that. I do think this presentation and this idea is a really good one, but I want to have, um, I want everyone to have a chance to ask questions and, and voice any concerns you might have. 
Commissioner McAnally, if I can add something, this is Scott. Yeah, of course. The, so for full disclosure, this once we start to do events, we would want to do something like this so we can understand from someone who's done these all over the country, how are we going to implement some things when we start doing our, our events again? So this is why this is an, another important factor for us as we start to get back to normal and things like that. So I just wanted to add that and, and how excited we are to be able to work with them, if possible. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Wallace. Do we have any questions or thoughts from the board? Uh, so, Commissioner Weiner, I do have a question. Sure thing. Um, so my curiosity would be in the other areas that you have put this on during the pandemic, um, do you have any idea of what your positivity rate was or impact of potential spreader events during that time? Did people stay in their cars? Was there a propensity for them to get out and wander and visit? Um, and what was the enforcement mechanism? Oh, this is Darren. Um, so they were, it, it was not a drive-in show. So they were in, we have roped off pods um, and everyone is, we have a, like a two hour entrance time. So it's an hour longer than a normal event would be for entrance time. Um, because of the ticketing system that we use, we have complete understanding and communication with all of the attendees it's one if they're one person buys four tickets so they can either bring you know it's one to four people are joining them so we had zero notifications of any contact tracing across the 11 events that we had we had zero complaints um and and lots of praise and honestly there was um there's there was not a single um like contact uh, back to us for contact tracing, but we have the ability because we maintain all of the buyer data to communicate directly with all of the patrons. Thank you. That's really good to know. I appreciate it. Um, You're back in alley, uh, Commissioner Hammer. Um, thank you, uh, team, for your your presentation. I, I think as as a board member who's you know wanted uh, to utilize these uh, new uh, fair park facilities uh, to the fullest extent and also to, to have concerts on on site. I think it's exciting to, to have uh, these these discussions um, in uh, in light of the, the the COVID issues and stuff. I, I did have a few questions. Maybe this is for um, for Laura and or, and or Scott at this point, but I'm assuming this would need to be run through the uh, Department of Health. Um, director like our other events correct and then can you talk to me talk to me about your comfort level and having uh, this type of an event so far yes it's laura yes we would need to to have um an application filled out there's actually as far as i'm aware there's two levels of of consideration or approvals from the health department one is um at least at the time was under 500 and another was over 500 so they have different criteria for the larger events um so yes there absolutely would be that approval that needs to happen through metro public health great um and i know we've had uh, some fits and starts with uh with promoters um uh, you know previously in concert and so you know having a, a kind of a relaunch uh, so to speak of the, these type of events i think with a uh with a promoter with uh, the history uh, putting on these type of events, uh, both both historically uh, in Nashville, but also uh, similar type of events recently uh, with, with the COVID, uh, you know, kind of pressures and, and re reconfigurations. I think think is uh, important. Uh, only other thing I, I was thinking through is just kind of about potential uh, choke points that we may have at, at bathrooms and and whatnot, and, and just making sure we put uh, you know put a lot of thought into how we uh, how we kind of manage crowd uh, in, in these type of uh, events for for our staff and, and the promoter as well. So thank you very much.
Uh, Genevieve, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but aren't, aren't the bathrooms color coded to prevent? Yeah, so, so the way that, that we have this set up is that your quadrant that you're in will have your own designated set of bathrooms. So it'll be divided up into four, the, the field of pods will be divided up into four quadrants and each of those quadrants will have its own set of concessions and its own set of restrooms. So, I mean, we'll have more, more than enough. It'll, it'll be enough for a show of 10 times, probably the amount of people that are gonna be there during normal times so that we can keep everything safe and line socially distanced and bathrooms, bathroom attendants that are making sure that they're sanitizing restrooms in between each guest. Thank you very much. Commissioner Bergeron, did you have anything you wanted to? Um, just a couple things. Uh, first, um, I, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness of the plan um, and, and materials we were provided. Uh, it's obvious a lot of a lot of care went into that, um, um, and, and I, 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 I think I like I think I like the potential orientation of the stage. I think that that uh, I would know it demonstrates sort of the, the thoughtfulness of of um, of impact. Um, uh, I guess a couple questions. The first one is I, I, I think it's been clear over the last year that I share Chair McAnally's um, <laughs> high level of concern about events um, um, in this in this day and age. And it's not so much uh, often the even the promoter, uh, but it, it's people and, and <laughs> unfortunately people um, and their, their own choices they've made during the last year um, and disregard uh, for what's going on. And so I guess in that, in that vein, um, could you talk a little bit more first about, um, about unfortunately enforcement, because I, this, this looks like a really well thoughtful plan, you know, requirements, I, I, I like all of that. Um, but just would like to hear a little bit about, you know, the, your willingness to frankly enforce um, careless, uh, enforce upon careless people who show up and, and break all of these very thoughtful plans and, and limits you've put into place and, and what, how you intend to, how, how you're, you know, prepared to, uh, to deal with, with hopefully what would be a very, a very small minority of careless people um, who might endanger others. That is a great question, and we are fully prepared to deal with that. What we have found in, in our um, dealings in Charleston is that the more that you over communicate with guests, the more that they can prepare themselves and understand the expectations that they're having. A ticket is a revocable license. And so if they aren't doing what's required to be at the event, they are required to leave the event. Um, and unfortunately, you know, COVID or no COVID, we've had shows where guests have to be escorted out. Um, we'll have Metro officers on site at all of our events and swiftly take care of anyone who is not willing to comply with these standards that are set. We will have information before you buy your ticket on what you're agreeing to before you get there. We'll have information that's sent out with your ticket purchase. We'll have pre-show emails. We will have information on the screens and posted as you come into the event. So it will be impossible for people to not understand what is expected of them. Um, we'll have someone speaking from the stage before the event begins, addressing everyone and, you know, in between sets. So it, it will be obnoxiously over communicated almost um, to make sure that people understand what's expected of them. I have worked shows where you can't have your phone out for a comedian or you get kicked out of the building. And, you know, as soon as the first person gets kicked out, people start taking it pretty seriously. Um, so it's the same thing that we've, we've done our, our whole careers in this, um, just looking a little bit differently, but the more that we over communicate with guests, um, the easier it will be for them to comply and realize we mean business. We want you to have fun, but within certain boundaries. Great. I really appreciate that. Um, thank you. Um, and, and as a lawyer, of course, I like, I like hearing words like revocable license. Um, I may be the only one who, who gets excited about things like that. Um, um, I uh, did, did have a, a, just a, a little bit of feedback um, um, related to um, uh, 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 kind of commu community impact. And, and as I mentioned, I really like the, the thoughtfulness as to the design, um, but also wanted to just put a plug in um, for, for Scott and everybody. You know, the, the, one, the one thing we had talks about at the board level and things I've been 
talking about it as to individual facilities is, is trying to get concerts over with by 10 p.m. Um, understanding the realities as a as a and challenges as a as a very avid concert goer myself, but but just think that with the surrounding communities um, um, and and the location and this not this not being downtown, I, I do really continue to believe that 10 p.m. is an appropriate end time for concerts at the site. Um, so just wanted to put that feedback in, especially if this is going to be a multi multi event uh, series um, um, for for the area. Uh, I think that that would go an, an awful long way uh, towards being a good being a good neighbor if we can accomplish it. This is Darren. I'll jump in and say um, our plans are to have 90 to 120 minute shows maximum with probably again an hour and a half to two hours um, entrance time. So 10 p.m. curfew is very easy uh, for us to meet. We kind of anticipated that um, starting at eight o'clock and ending at 10. Um, we may very well, if we can have, get all the approvals um, on this, we may very well just have one artist performing for 90 to 120 minutes. That's what we did in Charleston. We didn't actually have two artists with your typical 20 to 30 minute break in between. Um, and, and most most folks appreciated the opportunity to get out outside and have a couple of hours of, of safe live music. Thank you, Darren. Any other questions from the board? Yes, this is Commissioner Mayor. I just want to point out one quick thing that Laura, you might want to follow up on just so that we have, if nothing else, a point of comparison. Um, I believe that the Titans might have done a couple of concerts with Live Nation, and uh, maybe you ought to call them and get best practices. Um, I think maybe Burt Nihill and um, Gil Beverly might be your two contacts over there. Um, I know that Gil was liaisoning with uh, the health department and Live Nation, so it might be, you know, just to give some point of comparison for us in terms of how to move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Weiner. I, I have made that note, and I will follow up. Um, and I just wanted to note that we are joint venture partners. This is Genevieve, sorry. Um, we're joint venture partners with Live Nation, so we have a thorough understanding of what they did in the parking lot there um, and have had a complete rundown on what the health policies were from them and how everything went. So we, we understand that. We also work with the Opry House and the Ryman, who are doing indoor shows. So we understand what their policies have been and and any problems that have gone along the way. So we're we're really in communication with everyone who has done something like this in the community to know what best practices are and what expectations are as well. Excellent. Any anything else from the board? As is Commissioner Bergeron, I would just I would just encourage for, for booking choices. Uh, uh, try to avoid DJs with with uh, the, the bass drops um, as we found uh, a couple years ago. Thanks. We have zero plans to bring in a DJ. Zero. <laughs> <laughs> no, nothing against DJs. Just not on not on our agenda. No, of course not. Well, I want to thank um, Genevieve and Darren for being here with us and, and giving us that thoughtful overview. I'm hopeful and excited um, that we can potentially a, entertain some people, B, um, perhaps all of us make a little bit of money in the pandemic and, and C, um, that we can put some people in the music business back to work um, in this trying time. So I really want to um, really want to let them know that we appreciate them uh, bringing this to us and look forward to working with them. And for our board members, if you have any questions or concerns, please um, let Laura know and uh, we'll keep you completely in the loop of what's going on here as this unfolds. And if we have, oh, go ahead, Genevieve. Thank you guys for having us. We really yes. appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Thank you all. And if we have no other comments, questions, concerns, it looks like that's all we have for today. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Commissioner Hammer, motion to adjourn. Commissioner Bergeron, second. We'll take a roll call. Um, Commissioner Hammer? Aye. Commissioner Bergeron? Aye. <laughs>
Sorry, I think you got covered up for the record. You... Aye, Commissioner... Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Wiener? Aye. And I, Commissioner McNally, am I as well. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next month. This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.